this is a view of Huascaran. It's the highest tropical mountain uh, on Earth. It's also one of our drill sites uh, in Peru. Uh, fantastic record uh, from this, this part of the world. And I want to say that what we do in the center is a result of a team, a very important team, and uh, that they consist of uh, uh, our professionals, uh, plus our graduate students and our postdocs, and of course the funding agents that make this work possible. So this evening I want to talk about glaciers as recorders of, of climate change. I'm going to give some examples of change uh, climate house that impacted past cultures in Peru. Uh, glaciers as indicators of climate change uh, because they respond uh, to climate change and then give some evidence from recent acceleration in the rate of uh, ice loss and evidence for some glaciers such as Kelkaya being smaller than it has been in over 6,000 years. And then I'll talk uh, uh, a little bit about our, what I see as our greatest challenges in the 21st century. If you go into the entranceway of the National Academy in Washington, you'll see this on the wall. This is Charles Keeling's curve of the increase in CO2. And it's amazing when he started uh, making these measurements, there was very little support to do it. And now it's probably the, uh, the hallmark of the indication of how humans are impacting the planet. And you'll see that the rise continues right up, right up to the present. Uh, on top of that, we, we have in the ice cores a history that goes back now 800,000 years of CO2 shown here in blue and methane in red uh, from the bubbles of air trapped in the ice. And it
cold it is out there. We have over 7,000 <coughs> acres stored at minus 30 degrees C. It's the only tropical collection on Earth. And we design and build the drills that we use, the lightweight drills that go up to these high elevations to recover those cores. So uh, it takes a, a major effort. Uh, all these points are places where our team here at Elias State has drilled. And the whole idea is to get a global picture of climate recorded uh, in the ice. Uh, this is what a typical drilling uh, 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 operation looks like. This is actually drilling Gilgaya. Uh, uh, and uh, we put a lot of effort in, in getting the quality of cores. Uh, we've developed solar power systems to drive those uh, drills because we run on DC power. And we can switch to a diesel generator, which has been modified to run at high elevation and cold temperatures, which people don't generally like to do. Uh, so all of those things are uh, make what we do uh, possible. I think sometimes we forget that we live on a sphere. And because we live on a sphere, uh, we have about 50% of the world's population actually, uh, uh, well, 50% of the land surface uh, in the tropics, between 30 north and 30 south, and 70% seven billion people living in that zone. And also we forget it's, a, it's really a water world. Uh, you know, 70% of our surface area is, is water and ocean. And that plays a very important part in the future and, uh, uh, climate and the past in climate. A water vapor, which is a very important greenhouse gas. As you can see, this is the, uh, the average <coughs> from the year 2009. And you can see this is a tropical drought. And you can see where the uh, drill sites are located. And it brings a very uh, uniform record uh, to this part of the world. If you look at sea surface temperatures uh, in this middle panel, and you look at precipitation, you can see how these two are linked. But when you get up to 500 millibar level, where these glaciers are located, temperatures in the tropics are very un uniform. And this is something that's very uh, pronounced in our climate system uh, for the Earth. And I think that's why uh, we see such similar records uh, throughout the tropics. This is uh, where Kalkaya uh, ice cap is located. It's the largest tropical ice cap on Earth, and uh, a place where we've been working for, for many years now. Uh, this is what the ice cap looks like. It's 18,678 feet. It sits right above the Amazon basin, and it provides a tremendous history of the past climate uh, in this region. What an ice core looks like uh, before they, uh, they went up downstairs in our freezer. And uh, if you look at this part of the world, throughout Peru, there's a very pronounced wet season and dry season. The dry season is June, July, and August. And because of that, in these glaciers, there is a tremendous record that you can actually see. Every dry season is a, is a particle layer. And if you go down into the glass, you can actually see how uniform these layers are. And if you measure those thicknesses, you can calculate how precipitation has changed through time. So they're a wonderful archive of the past. When they come back and we do the analysis downstairs, uh, this is the isotope record, and this is the dust record. This is from 1805 to 1825. And so you can see, you just count those layers back, and that's how you get your calendar. You go back deeper in the core, this is uh, from 1520 up to about 1560. Uh, the Spanish arrived in this part of the world in 1531. So that's the first written records that we interpret or can interpret from this part of the world. Uh, but the ice uh, uh, the glacier was recording long before that. So we can go back and look at here 1240 to 1330. And, uh, and you can reconstruct the history of climate and environment over that period. One of the things that's remarkable about this ice field is the reproducibility of the record. When we first drilled there back in 1983, we didn't have the technology to keep ice frozen. And we brought back 6,000 bottled water samples. The isotopes were analyzed, and that's the blue curve you see here. 20 years later, we went back with new technology, and we brought back frozen cores, which allow us to measure chemistry and other things that you couldn't do on the water samples. And you can see the reproducibility that record. So it's a, it's a wonderful archive. And if you look further back, this is the GAO averages of the isotopes for the last thousand years. Warm periods that are shown in red, the little ice age, shown in blue, and then the warming uh, in the 20th century. So these 
this is from the water samples, and this is from the core village to summit in 2003. And uh, this is a core from two kilometers away. So it's really the reproducibility of these records that are, is so amazing uh, for this part of the world. So if you can take those layer thicknesses, and you can also calculate precipitation in that mountain. So here, we're looking at dry periods are in brown. Uh, the blue show wet periods in the past. Uh, the Little Ice Age was initially wet and then dry. In the 20th century, it's wetter than average. So all things being equal, these glaciers should be growing uh, in today's world because there's more precipitation. Now the question that we've uh, wrestled with is what do the isotopes in these cores tell us? And we can see here that the greatest correlation, this is looking at from 1854 uh, to uh, 1993, looking at sea surface temperatures measured in the Pacific Ocean, and looking at the isotopes uh, from the Kelkai uh, ice cap, as well as from Boscovon in Peru, and Gatuku over uh, on the other side of the world. And if you look at those, what you find is that you're really getting specific tropical temperatures in those isotopes. And you can see that here. Uh, the, uh, the isotopes here are shown in uh, blue, and the temperatures measured, sea surface temperatures, are in red. You can see how they're capturing that. So if you assume that that will remain constant uh, through time, Kelkaya allows you to look at over this period where we have records, and then come up with a uh, correlation coefficient and an equation by which we can turn those isotope values into SSTs in the Pacific Ocean and allows us to look at the last 1,800 years of that part of the world. So a wonderful, a wonderful record. Now, there are uh, archaeologists and anthropologists have been working in this part of the world for uh, a very long time, and there was many civilizations before the Spanish arrived in 1531. So we worked with uh, people like uh, uh, Alan Collada at the University of Chicago, looking at the history of climate and people in this part of the world. Uh, one of the things we find is that when there uh, is an El Nino, the northern part of Peru is very wet, and the southern part where this ice cap is located is very dry. So the extent of the sea salt there that occurs every four to seven years when there's an El Nino. When you look at the long-term precipitation histories in this part of the world, uh, this record goes back 1,800 years. So this is the precipitation curves, the blues go wet, and the browns are dry. So when it's dry in the Alifano, you see cultures uh, like the mochi forming on the coast, the apple is on the coast. When it becomes wet in the highlands, people tend to move inland, the capitals are in the highlands, so here we get the Kiwanaku and the Wari cultures. When it becomes dry again in the highlands, people move back to the coast, so you have the, the Chamur uh, cultures developing. And then when it becomes wet again, uh, the Inca Empire develops. Capital is in the highlands. And so you see this seesaw of people uh, over these uh, periods of uh, three to 400 years. Uh, what is interesting is that if you look at Peru today, since the 1940s, people have been moving from the highlands to the coastal areas, looking for better jobs, uh, better education in the cities. First, the, uh, the past would say that people actually should be moving in the highlands where the water is now located. And so we now have water shortages uh, in, the, in the coastal desert areas for many different reasons. And you have the, uh, Lima, Peru looking at building tunnels through the Andes to capture water that now goes into the Amazon and bring it back over to where the people are. So the, uh, you can get a perspective of the past. We measure many things, and I'm not going to bore you with all of these. Uh, but we talked about the Little Ice Age, and you'll see that a lot of these show similar uh, responses during the Little Ice Age. The thing that's really different here is uh, if you look at the chloride and the fluoride, there are two spikes that are totally different. And that raises the question of what is causing those. Mm -hmm. And so we, we uh, developed these records from around the world. So here's Kilkaya, and we have another record of the monsoons over here from Dasuku at the top of the Himalayas. So if you go to Dasupu, this is the top of the Himalayas, and we have a record there that goes over the same period of time. It doesn't have the annual resolution that Kaya has so far back in time. 
But if you look at the period of overlap, this is the last 250 years of isotopes and uh, uh, from, from the Himalayas and from the Andes, you see this same trend. And if you look at the chloride, you'll see a very similar trend. And you see this big event around 1790. This big event occurred first uh, uh, in the monsoon system and then later in South America. And we know that in 1792, in central India, 600,000 people starved to death because of the monsoon feathers at that time. And we know that in South America, there was a tremendous uh, El Nino event. And so the question is, how often do these events occur? Because in 1790, we didn't have over 1 billion people living in India. Such an event in today's world would become uh, have, uh, extreme social and economic impact. So here, here's the 1790 events. And then you look at these scores and you see another event around 1345. And that event corresponds to the Black Death in Europe. Uh, and some people think that the bacteria that was carried by the fleas, very temperature sensitive, very precipitation sensitive. And the question of what role did weather and climate play in the spread of, of that uh, back in 1345. Uh, so there's a tremendous archive uh, in these glaciers. Uh, you can look at the composite. This is the last 2,000 years, isotopes from these tropical glaciers. Uh, this is the medieval warm period, the little ice age and the warming of the 20th century. If you look at northern hemisphere reconstructions based on tree rings and, and uh, observations and the instrumental record here, and what really stands out is what's happened in the last 50 years in, uh, in these records. Now, what really stands out if you work on these glaciers is the change. This is the margin of Kilkaya in 1977. This is the same place in 2002. And, and you can see that not only are we losing ice, which is a very important water resource for these areas, but we're also losing the history that's stored in that frozen, frozen archive. Uh, as this glacier has uh, retreated, uh, this area is, uh, uh, is now a lake. And the back side of this lake is shown here in 2002, which is actually around this ridge. Uh, this is a wall of retreating ice. It's 30 meters high. It's a person to scale. And right at the base here, we found a plant, a wetland plant, no woody tissue, perfectly preserved. And it's possible to identify that plant. It's also possible to carbon date it. And the fact that there's no woody tissue says that this plant has been under ice for 5,200 years. Had it been exposed, it would have decayed. And so as this wall has retreated, this is in 2002, here's the plant. Uh, by 2005, here's the plant, and here's the wall. And there are many more plants that come out, and we collected those and dated them. And we find as more plants come out, they're older. And so uh, in the science paper that just came out uh, 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 this month uh, for this particular talk, uh, there's a research article on this, uh, on this ice cap. And uh, here are the plants. All the plants collected here uh, between 2002 and 2009 all date 4,700 years in age. Plants collected in 2011 on the other side of this lake where land was just exposed all date around 6,300 years in age. So it tells us that it took 1,600 years for the ice to grow from here to capture the plants over here. It's taken 25 years for it to move from here over to where we are there. So it's retreating 65 times faster than it advanced 6,000 years ago. Now, we can put this in a longer time perspective from records from Peru. Uh, so here we, we drilled Lascaron, a uh, wonderful record there. We took six tons of equipment up this ladder, and 53 days later, 10 tons, including two frozen ice cores, down that ladder. Uh, we drilled it with using solar power. And uh, that record is tremendous for giving a time perspective. Uh, this is the isotope curve, which is our temperature proxy. And if you take the modern isotopes and you project back in time, you have to get back to 6,000 years before you get to temperatures like we're seeing today. And that's where these plants are coming out. And we imagine as we go forward in time, there'll be older plants coming out. And you can actually date uh, how long it has been 
since this ice cap has been as small as it is today. And the longer term, the torsion here is by insulation, uh, precession driven insulation in the tropics. So you can see this is a very smooth curve. This is orbital forcing. And you can see how abrupt this change has been uh, in, in, in the last uh, couple of years. So um, you can see the change. I like this quote. This comes from Henry Pollock's book, A World Without Ice. This ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates, is not burdened with any ideology, carries no political baggage as it changes from a solid to a liquid. It just melts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's exactly what it's doing. And all through the Andes, the glaciers are melting. Uh, this is the largest outlet glacier coming off of Chilkaya, Corey Taylor. This is what it looked like in 1978. This is what it looked like in uh, 2011. That lake now covers 84 acres, and it's over 200 feet deep. It didn't start to develop until 1991. So it shows the change. And here, you can actually see the retreat. This is 1978. And you watch this, and this brings us up to 2011. Uh, so so the, uh, the changes there are, are <coughs> tremendous. And you can see this on the longer term uh, time periods. This is a photo of the earliest we could find taken on glass plates uh, in the 1930s of this. Uh, there's a religious site here, Kiri Riti. And we went back to this place, back to this same rock, to take a picture in 2006. And if you compare that, those two photos, where you see the bright areas, it's where the glaciers are today. So you can see they're not only retreating up these valleys, they're also thinning from the top down. And that's an important phenomenon that's happening in many of these glaciers. So here's Kokaya. This is a Landsat image uh, from 1988. Uh, quarter, uh, the uh, Cordillera is up here. Uh, this is a, a, a vision of this place in 19, uh, 2006, so 18 years later. And if you look at the yellow, this represents the area of ice moss. So you can see it's not just Kokaya, it's all these glaciers through this area. And over this 18-year period in Cordillera uh, Vilcanota, 24% uh, of the ice has been lost. So if you look at the world as a whole, these are the places where the ice is being lost. It's not just in the Andes. And we're very concerned about what that will do for sea level. We know sea level is rising now about 3.5 uh, millimeters per year. Uh, and you can look at this and say, well, what if you would lose 8% of the ice that's now on land? What, what would our coastline look like? So here's the Gulf Coast, uh, Florida, Miami down here. This is what it would look like if we lost 8% of the ice on land. And we've already lost 25% 20 20 of the Kelsey ice cap since I was a graduate. So these, are, these are huge, huge changes. So how to manage a world with threats from climate change, rising sea level, and rising energy consumption. I mean, these are the problems that we're, that we're faced with as we look into the future. But the people who live here are already seeing the impacts of these changes. Uh, this lake that formed, uh, this was all ice when I first went there. The glacier was in here. This lake formed, and we were surprised in 2007 to see that it had drained. And all the water that was in this lake actually flowed out underneath the ice on the backside of this ridge. So this is the backside you see here. And this was, it was actually standing in the, in the lake bottom. And so the valley to the south was flooded, and the valley to the north, there's no water in it. And so the people used to graze their alpaca here. Uh, that's no longer possible. Uh, the other thing is the geologic hazards that come from this retreat. I showed you this lake uh, that's formed here. This is taken in July of 2005. In March of 2006, there was an avalanche that came off of here, fell into this lake, caused the mini tsunami that flooded this pasture all the way down, drowning uh, uh, alpaca. Uh, this is what it looked like in July of uh, 2006, and you see all the debris across that map. So these are these are huge changes, and the people who live here are living on the on the margin of sustainability, and so they're already being impacted by these changes. And if we look at our future, looking out, this is a projection of what will happen to temperatures on the planet with 800 parts million volume of CO2. Uh, we get this temperature rise at the surface of about three degrees, but at these high elevation sites, you're looking five to six degrees. 
So these glaciers are going to respond much faster to that change than, than what we see at the surface of the planet. So if we look at our options as a society, I think that we have three. I used to have prevention. I don't think that's no longer, no longer an option for us. We, we can talk about mitigation, <coughs> which means taking measures to reduce the pace and magnitude of the changes in global climate that are caused by human activity. Uh, examples of mitigation include reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, enhancing the sinks for those gases, and geoengineering to counteract the effects of those greenhouse gases. Those are all things we can discuss. Adaptation, which means taking measures to reduce the adverse impacts on human well-being that result from climate changes that do occur. Examples would be changing agricultural practices, strengthening defenses against climate-related diseases, and building more dams and dikes. But this is a moving part. And the last is suffering, and that is the adverse impacts that are not avoided by either mitigation or adaptation. So uh, if you're looking at Peru, I think you have to look at practical measures to prepare for and adapt to uh, predicted changes in Peru. And some of these are conservation of, in this case, water supplies. That is, you can look at price controls on water uh, for urban areas. Uh, a shift to less water intensive agriculture. You can look at, instead of open ditches that are used now, to look at uh, drip agriculture. You can uh, look at creation of island reservoirs to stabilize cycle of seasonal runoff. The problem is because of that very distinct wet and dry season. In the dry season, the streams are fed uh, in part by the melting of these glaciers. And as they become smaller, there's less water. Uh, but if you're uh, are producing hydroelectricity, this becomes a big issue because you have to produce it uh, year round. And the shift to power uh, generation from uh, resources other than hydropower. Currently, 48% of Peru's power comes from Hydropower, 52% from fossil fuels. So let me conclude by saying I think the greatest challenges that we face in the 21st century will be learning how to get along with each other. It's something that's been with us for a long time, and you can debate how well we're actually doing that. And, and then learning how to get along with our planet, for which we depend for life as we know. And these two challenges deal with human behavior, and they're closely related when we look. So with that, I will close and thank you for listening. Thank you. So there is certainly an awareness in the room amongst uh, the general public that things are, things are changing. So in Peru, in the next 10 years, they will become, make new lakes because of basin increase, the basin increase, there will be no more ice in those woods, so the water will increase. And back into New York, back into Washington DC, because there will be no longer ice. Next 20 years. Uh, the, the, some glaciers like Kelkai, I mean, 
Okay, it's a huge ice cap. It's 168 meters thick. It will it'll be there for a while. But the lower elevation glaciers go first, and then the higher elevations. And, and, and if we look at freezing lines uh, throughout the tropics, it's rising. Mm -hmm. The temperature is it, rising. So more and more glaciers get impacted. But if you look at the world as a whole, mountain glaciers, if you melt all of them, you will add about a half a meter to global sea level. The big elephants in the room are Greenland and Antarctica. And there's a lot of concern with what's happening in Greenland right now. You can get six meters of sea level rise if you melt that ice sheet. West Antarctica, you melt that, you'll get another five or six meters. East Antarctica, you'll get, you'll get something close to 55 meters from, from that ice sheet. So uh, the mountain glaciers to me are, are uh, they're responding now. And if you think about impacts on people, that is now, whether you are in the Andes, and Peru is a very important place because 70% of the world's tropical glaciers are in Peru. And therefore, the lifestyle has been built around water and those rivers that are driven by those glaciers. But it's an equal problem when you go to Tibet, to the Himalayas, where there are 46,000 glaciers, and there's the headwaters of rivers like the Indus, and the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra River. So, so what's happening to those glaciers globally, uh, it's very important to all of us. I'm going to have to cut it off mm -hmm. and invite people who want to ask questions to do so. We'll move along to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Brian Mark from the Department of Health. Okay, thanks very much. Um, it's really an honor to follow Lonnie. Uh, I would draw your attention to this picture here. We are together on Kilimanjaro in 2006. But I would give you a little buyer beware. I first met these guys when I was a 20-something year old and not quite sure what I was doing in my life. And I caught some sort of bug. <laughs> so beware, if you're here for the first time, you never know what might happen. Um, so what I'm going to do is pick up on this great theme that Lonnie's uh, really told us about, set it on a global scale, and given us a really important time perspective and a cultural perspective on what this means to go through climate change with melting glaciers in, a, in an area of the world that relies heavily on them. And I'm going to take us on a quick tour down from where those glaciers are melting in the Cordillera Blanca, the same mountain range that Huascaran is in, down <coughs> to where they form rivers, go through those hydropower processing plants that are really important to electric generation in Peru, and then ultimately irrigate a desert into now an agro-export economy that's a huge part of a 9% per year GDP growth rate in Peru. So my group uh, is called Glacial Environmental Change. This work that I'm going to talk to you about is a summary from um, a number of different projects. These are just a list of some collaborators and institutes and funding agencies that need to get a shout out from our group. Um, we call ourselves Glacier Environmental Change, and you can go to our website off the Bird Polar Research Center uh, homepage, and you can see uh, the cast of characters that we have currently. And um, I would acknowledge all of these wonderful students and researchers that are part of the team, and uh, give a shout out to Ollie's in the audience, Ollie's somewhere. Right there, you can talk to him. Here he is up on the, one of the peaks in the Cordillera Blanca. Um, but these guys are doing a lot of really integrated geography. We're in the geography department, which means we couple human and natural systems. And we have projects that range along the American Cordillera all the way up to Alaska. Uh, but you can see a lot of it focuses right here in Peru. And there's my photo that you had from the talk, and I'll sort of center it there. Right at 9 degrees south latitude in the Cordillera Blanca, where I went as a Fulbright student in 1998. And I learned Spanish by immersion. And I spent my time with a family of Alcides Ames, who was the one sole Peruvian scientist that I could find published internationally about glaciers. And uh, it turns out he ran a guest house um, 
here's my family that came to visit me, so uh, my families combined. We now go and return every year to that same guest house. You can go on Facebook and check it out. It's called Mi Casa. If you're ever in Huaraz, go check it out. But my point here is that science in this context is very relational. And I think a lot of what we've seen through the Bird Center and through uh, Lonnie and Ellen combined, um, the commitment to place and time is significant, and it goes through people. So here we are in the central Andes of Peru. The tropical glaciers, as Lonnie just said, 70% of which reside in Peru. You can see that a lot of the rest of them are in the Andes. Um, we're going to go to this part right here. Here's Lima, and you go up here on a seven-hour bus ride to the Cordillera Blanca. And just to reinforce the point that these glaciers are disappearing, here's a summary graph from a few years ago just pointing out relative rates of loss for tropical glaciers with regard to global pictures and maybe more of the mid-latitudes that we're more familiar with. Um, and you can see that these rates of recession are equal and exceeding those in other parts of the world. Now if we take sort of an oblong view, this is a NASA uh, whirlwind photo, it's not Google Earth, just a sort of shout out to NASA, um, of an oblique angle to show you what the Cordillera Blanca looks like arranged along here these uh, a number of peaks over 6,000 meters, to about 30 of them, a lot of them above 5,000 meters. But here running to the north is what's known as the Santa River that drains the western side of those glaciers and combines with rivers coming off the Rio Negra or the Cordillera Negra which of course in Spanish means black mountain range because there are no longer any active glaciers. It's in the rain shadow. And you can see that the main population center is what us. It's about 100 thousand people there, but throughout this valley, which is known as the Callejon de Huaylas, we have over 250,000 people. And I would add that in the latest population results from 2010, it's these mid-sized cities that are growing even faster than Lima now. Okay? So this is really kind of an important reality uh, of glaciers next to people. And I'm going to take my story from, we had an embedded reporter with us last summer. Barbara Fraser, who's a Peruvian, she's actually an expatriate American, um, but she lives down there and loves this area and writes very passionately about the environment. This was a news feature that came out in Nature, and she followed us uh, down from the glaciers to the coast, and her story really picks up this theme of what does it mean when this snow and ice disappears to locals. Here's a quote from a local talking about how uh, the ice is moving up little by little, and when the snow disappears, there will be no water. And so here's a few of my grad students um, and associates, collaborators, showing some of the ways that we've been trying to trace that meltwater from the ice that's melting down through this river system, keeping in mind, of course, that we're in a very active hydrologic cycling. Lonnie showed you the tropical uh, hydrologic moisture and how intense that is. That's one of the most intense hydrologic or climatologic features on the planet is the Hadley cycle. Okay, so we have a very wet and a dry season, 80% of the rain falling in six months of the year. So that buffering capacity of the melting ice is really important during the rest of the year. So we're trying to figure out just how much water is coming from the ice and really mixing methods. Okay? So what we're trying to do here, here's the, the quote that I had in here, was we're trying to cross these traditional boundaries and not studying water separately from the people. And in so doing, we're looking at quantifying discharge in the river, uh, installing some groundwater wells, because really one of the major sources of water ultimately is the groundwater. Okay? The great glaciers provide a very small percentage overall. And here we are looking at water quality indicators because as the water decreases in quantity, that quality of water becomes ever more important. So this is the, the entire Santa River watershed in a GIS coverage. You can see the covered total area is about 12,000 square kilometers. Again, here's the main city of Huaraz. There's another big city, Katak, and I'll show you a number of hydrochemical results so you can keep in mind where those cities are. The whole course of the river runs about 300 kilometers, takes a left-hand turn through an amazing gorge and goes out to the Pacific Ocean where it runs through one of the drier deserts of the world um, and into the Pacific. Huascaran, again the highest peak in Peru. Rapid glacial recession is the characteristic of this range but also there's a number of emerging social vulnerabilities because when you look at the life, livelihoods of people in this part of the world, we have traditional agro-pastoralism is one part what you see outlined in black, grid cells through the watershed, are all active mining claims. That's over 50% of the watershed area is claimed by mines. Now one of the major, again, revenue generators for Peru is export of minerals, as it has been since colonial times. 
That has a big impact on water. It has a big use of water, but it also impacts the water quality. I'm going to talk about the Cuyahunda Wireless as the upper watershed that drains all these glacierized areas. This is defined by the poor point of the, the Canyon del Pato hydropower plant, one of a number of them before you get to the coast. And then what's really surprising now is to see the extent to which the desert coast has been transformed into productive agriculture, most of which is exported, 99% of which is exported. Okay? And you can see here uh, some of the principal crops. Just to note, one of them is a very thirsty crop called asparagus. And I would challenge you next time you're at Giant Eagle or wherever you shop to look to see where that asparagus comes from and see if it doesn't come from Peru. You see Peru is one of the major exporters um, and producers of asparagus. And it's happening, actually, if you think about it, as a virtual export of glacial meltwater to some degree. So we're trying to figure out what that is and also what are the impacts. The other thing is, coupled with our social scientists and our historians, we've been able to look and access some of the production records for pro crops. And what you can notice here uh, that jumps out at you is the change between a decade from 1960 to 69 and from 2000 to 2009 in these different principal crops. Okay? And you can notice right off the bat, just if you look at percent change, how big asparagus is, because it was vir virtually nothing in, in 1969. But by 2000, 2009, it had a huge growth. But notice where the negatives are. There's a decrease, a concomitant decrease in things like barley, okay? things like alfalfa, things like wheat, okay? and of course, la papa. Okay? We had a number of wonderful potato dishes that for dinner tonight, okay? the home of the potatoes. These are subsistence level crops that are decreasing at the expense of huge export led agriculture. So uh, just to show you what this might mean economically, you might think, well, this is a great revenue generator. Again, look at the GDP growth in Peru in recent years, 9%. Just last 2011, it was six, almost 7%. Um, but for every dollar that a US consumer is going to spend on imported asparagus from Peru, only about 70 cents is actually staying in the US. So you then get 30 cents that's going maybe to the Peruvian farmers. But even of that, a lot of that ends up coming back to the US because of this economic global system that we're in through the seed production, through the materials for processing, the fertilizer, and the pesticides. Furthermore, there's huge tax breaks for these people that are generating profit. Okay? So think about some of the implications economically of this system and um, whether or not this is really benefiting local Peruvians. So our overall question in this integrated geography has been to look at, first of all, quantifying just how much glacier loss there's been. I'm not going to dwell so much on that now. Um, we've talked about that in previous Peru nights, but I'll be happy to sh show papers or results of our uh, tracking that volume loss. But now we're thinking more about this downstream hydrologic transformation to the entire watershed and what impact it has on people. So as Lonnie's up getting these amazing archives in the snow-capped and ice-capped peaks, we're down in the mid-flanks and below looking at the water coming from there and going to the coast. We have quantified the volume loss of glaciers in one significant fact is affirming exactly what Lonnie was observing in those photographs of the thickness change in glaciers. So if you predict the total volume loss from surface area, you can see that actually we're losing that at an even faster rate than you'd predict because of this shrinkage. And then in terms of water and timing, if you can imagine a hydrograph, which is simply the discharge or total volume through time in a river, when you melt glaciers that are traditionally storing that high liquid in a solid form, you're initially going to have more water. Okay? But at some point, you're going to then have a diminishing return. And when, when you actually pass that peak water is an important variable that we've been trying to track using hydrochemical mixing models. And this is a recent paper we had in the Journal of Glaciology that summarizes a point here that when you look at the entire watershed, you hear there's a number of different tributaries that are glacierized in the Santa River shed, watershed. A lot of these have already passed peak water. So this was kind of a surprise because a lot of people were thinking, well, we, might, we still have a couple decades before we reach this point of diminishing returns. Um, and so our interest has then been to look at how the water changes in its characteristics going from the glacier to the coast. And the first primary control in any kind of water quality is the geology of a region. And this is where the Cordillera Blanca is another fascinating geologic uh, field camp excursion because of the wonderful geology. You have this intrusive body that uplifts through some metamorphic sedimentary rocks uh, that had fossils, some don't, depending on how much it's been metamorphosed. 
But what you get is some really crazy minerals. This is a, one of the reasons why you get one of the most productive gold mines in the world in 2003, okay? because some of those get uh, fluidized and concentrated into ore bodies. But the, the flip side of this coin is that you can have waters draining naturally across some of this terrain that have incredible amounts of concentrations of metals. Their pH can be on the order of three. This is a stream in Kilkaiwanka. It's drains right above the city of Waras. And if you look at some of the metals and the concentrations with regard to the World Health Organization standard of health, you can see that a number of these are an exceedance of recommended uh, contaminant levels, okay, naturally. We're calling this natural acid mine drainage as a result of the geology. But this, of course, doesn't uh, get at the not natural acid mine drainage and other problems when you take mine tailings. And in a culture that sees the river as a big flushing mechanism and doesn't treat a lot of wastewater and throws mine tailings directly in the river course, you can see uh, these huge tailings here, again, right outside the city of Katak in the southern end of the Cordillera Blanca. Another couple of views of what this looks like. Um, people are accessing this water for many daily usage. And um, if you look carefully, you might see some really nasty stuff in that photo, so I won't dwell on it. But you can see that we've been trying to measure the quality of this water, different indicators, because this is obviously a very direct usage point for people. And just to give you one indicator of some of the important uh, trace metals we've been able to measure here at the Mendenhall uh, labs, this just shows you a couple sample points on the Rio's upper Rio Santa, where in red we have a drastically over maximum contaminant levels in arsenic, which is a nasty chemical if you haven't heard of it. Okay, it does bad stuff to you. It's a carcinogen. 190 parts per billion that we measured coming out of one of these natural acid drainage combined with human use right below this mine tailings. And then in a couple places right outside Waras and just upriver where you're above, what is known as 10 parts per billion. Now that's the World Health Organization. Peru was still at an old level of 50 parts per billion. So you might argue that there's some relative political differentiation here, but we've all recognized that this is a dangerous level of arsenic. So obviously, um, one of our concerns is, can trace metals be an indicator of quality? Um, they obviously uh, can be dangerous if they also bioaccumulate through the system and through plants that keep in mind our agro-industrial agro interest at the end of this river. And so what we tried to do in a couple snapshot surveys, were called synoptic surveys of reach studies, we went from the glaciers all the way down to the coast in a mobile survey to get some idea as to what the water discharge looks like and what concentrations of a few specific trace metals look like. So I'm just going to give you some preliminary results to show you, again, one specific example of how maybe, if you will, global climate change, global macroeconomics, water demand, and um, cultural contexts all come together to uh, maybe make a really important point about human well-being. So what, what did we do? We um, got a bunch of grad students in a pickup. I was able to drive the turbo diesel. It appealed to me somehow. I spend most of my time biking and, and negotiating my way through traffic here in Columbus, so getting behind the wheel was fun. But we drove, again, all the way down the course of the river, sampling both the discharge, which is the cubic meters per second flowing past a point, and took samples to come back to the lab and analyze for concentrations of a number of different chemical species and elements. Um, this list here is, is just showing you some of the wonderful elements we can analyze. There's a machine downstairs here that does the same thing with ultra, ultra small concentrations tuned nicely for ice core concentrations. Whereas over in Mendenhall, we can use a wider range. We don't have to worry about gunking up the machine as much. So we've been looking at trace metals, other chemistry like major ions and isotopes. And the discharge, we came up with an acoustic Doppler profiler that allowed us to get a sounding of depth and velocity through the river. And we went all the way from where the Rio Santa begins in Conococha, a lake, all the way through the poor point of the, the La Balsa power plant and then down through the canyon to the coast. And uh, here's just a couple of action shots from the field. Here's Ollie on a suspended wire bridge to get across with the, the depth profiler. Um, and there we are sampling water. And what I'm going to show you are just some of the summer results, not only from the, from the Rio Santa itself, but from three other rivers that are also draining the coast to the Pacific coast. And these are uh, some data plots. So if you're still awake, 
Uh, this might put you right over. But um, <laughs> here we see concentrations in parts per billion. And um, here you see the species. You may not be able to read it that well. The Parivilka is a river here. The Supe here. The Rio Santa, the poor point here. Here's our watershed we've been talking about. And the Huacho. All along here, there's only very small perennial streams that don't actually manifest themselves at all in the dry season. So you can see here the Supe has a really high level of arsenic. If it gets above that line of 10, keep in mind that's above the World Health Organization um, maximum contaminant level. Uh, but then what you do, if, if you have this nice combined suite of data, you can multiply your discharge by your concentration and get what we call a bulk yield or bulk load. So that's the actual total in grams per day of some of these chemicals. And you can notice that the Rio Santa jumps off the chart above these other drainage, drainages in things like arsenic. That's about two kilograms of arsenic going to the Pacific each day. So um, we're finding these kind of shocking. You can see nickel is probably at a mineable level, at about a kilogram a day. Um, and then if you look just along the river, keep in mind this is a distance now from that upper lake all the way to the coast. The zero distance would be the high lake where the city of Huaraz is, is indicated here. And then Katak, you see this big spike right after that mine tailing. So this is clearly a human imprint on the arsenic source. But there's also a geologic one as you go down river. And if you concentrate the bulk load by, again, multiplying those small concentrations by discharge, which increases down slope, you can see where those relative amounts become bulk yields. Okay? And again, for abbreviations, there's arsenic and cadmium and copper nickel and lead, and then uranium. So what does this mean when we actually measure the discharge? This really underscores the point of how much water is going to irrigate the plants along the coast. This plot shows you the discharge that we measured, uh, again, along that same distance from the upper watershed at zero down all the way to the coast. And if you look at that, you can see that 80% of that water in the river is derailed before it gets to the coast, okay? And it's used for irrigation. Now, that's maybe an important um, achievement for human engineering and adaptation because when this, this actual project of Chavi Mochik was conceived, people realized that there's a lot of water that we're not using. Okay? So the, the thought was let's put it to good use. And this is a really important development step for Peru. So we don't want to undermine what that means to people and their livelihoods, but uh, that's some of the reality that we're starting to see in terms of implications for water quality. Um, again, we thought we might be run away from the Chavi Mochik folks, if we told them what we were doing, but they actually embraced us and said, will you please sample our plants? So when we go back this year, we're going to be sampling our asparagus, so no need to panic yet. We don't know how much mercury is in your, your asparagus yet, but we're going to try to get a hold of that. Uh, but here, just let me summarize the points here that the Santa River and most of its tributaries have probably passed what we're calling a critical threshold and are now in a decreasing dry season flow. Now, if you, if you remember that what that looked like, there was this bulge and then a decrease. An important point might be to figure out, well, where is the actual difference between where we started and where we end up? Okay? And that's where we're talking about a 3 to 30% change. So that's not the end of the world. We're not losing all our river water. So that's a hyperbole, an overstatement to say that. However, what we're doing is critically changing the seasonality of that flow. And for the entire river uh, of, of the Rio Santo, we're losing on the higher end of that, okay? a third of the water. Water quality is an emergent issue with a high metal concentrations that have both, again, a natural as well as a human or anthropogenic source. About 80% of the dry season discharge is extracted from that Pacific drainage for industrial agricultural irrigation, but also for municipal water to the cities along the coast and hydropower. The metal concentrations have already threatened water quality in some of these glacial melt streams, uh, and some of those yields to the Pacific of metals are on the orders of kilograms per day. And in the future, what we're going to be doing, again, is, is quantifying a bit more detail what these tributary inputs are in terms of discharge and chemistry with regard to glacier change and moving towards a more predictive model. But also, we need to get a better handle as to some of these controls that are fundamentally driving water chemistry. So there's our team coming out of a, a four-day excursion to the mountains, um, some related publications. And again, I'm happy to distribute these. These are all posted on our web page, and I'll leave it there with a OHIO, okay? So thank you very much.
too much population and what you be male population. The population will milk and what level will increase. Yep. In the next ten years there will be more pollution. Right. So one of the major sayings in, in environmental science is, uh, well, the question is, is how is this combination of population increase and pollution going to interface with water supply with the diminishing glaciers? And again, it's important to remember that the solution to pollution is dilution. Okay. So if you have less water and more pollution, your dilution's a problem, right? You're not as diluting as well and seasonally as effectively. So. Um, so the key questions are, to what degree are, are these pollution sources human versus geologic? And what are the remediation strategies going forward? And what we're already starting to see is, is municipal municipalities realize that we have to treat water much more effectively. Because again, there hasn't really been a need for, for treatment. A lot of stuff is just thrown right into the river because in that wet season, it just flushes all to the coast. We, we do get um, some seafood. I, we haven't checked any of the uh, biological end levels, or, or we haven't looked at, at the plants yet or the seafood, but we will be looking at plants. Um, I'm not much of a fisherman. I've tried really hard to catch trout, but they run away from me. A lot of this, the streams are stocked with trout. Uh, there's a big aquaculture movement, and so those that feed right within the riparian zone would be important to look at. So if you know anything about that, come along. You could use your <laughs> skills. <laughs> well, if people have more questions for Lonnie, too, maybe we can open it up. Or, uh, oh, no, I don't want to change the schedule. Yeah, that sounds like a way to go. Yeah, it, it's off now. Oh, all right. So the, the live stream will now end, and we'll have the video. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain that in a second. <laughs> so the, uh, there, there's copyright issues. The, the filmmaker that um, will give you some background about, about him, but he's based in Seattle, and, and the film is a negotiation for being broadcast. So as a courtesy showing it, but you're probably the only the third group to see it at the center. So we, because we are involved in the data and some of the video, he's allowed us to show it to the center because it sh connects the science here with what's happening on the ground. And he follows five different countries in South America. So a few, uh, before we get to that, that'll be the last segment for tonight. But I need to make a, a few thank yous. Thank you for everybody for attending both in person and online. Um, I also want to go ahead and thank all the partners we had involved because there's actually quite an extensive list of people that were involved in putting the program together tonight. Uh, the Department of Geography and Center for Latin American Studies that helped fund um, the food you ate this evening. Doctors Thompson and Mark for presenting. Uh, the IT staff, you see Wes Haynes in the back and also Tom Castlebaum, who went ahead and set up the stream today. We're kind of testing a lot of new technology, so they've been working feverishly the last few days to make sure that all the equipment was running and everything was, was coordinated. Laura Kissel for bringing over all the materials from archives to show us this evening. Make sure you, you stop and see those on the way out. Aaron Wilson, who in addition to me went ahead and gave some tours this evening uh, to some of the people in attendance. And then Lynn Everett and Janelle Henderson, who you saw earlier tonight, who helped coordinate the food and make sure that everything was set up for you to eat. We'd also add, if you want to follow up with future events, if anybody's on social media, we do have a pretty big Twitter and Facebook presence. So you're more than welcome to follow us. Just do a search for Bird Polar. And then we also have an email list. So if you go ahead and email me, we'll be happy to put you on that or just check our website. We try to get stuff on there as timely as possible. Yes? What is the website? Um, it's uh, BPRC, dub, Wes, help me here, website. BPRC.osu.edu. Thank you. BPRC, Bird Polar Research Center. I have it bookmarked, so <laughs> <laughs> and I go there a lot. Um, a few other things, I, I just want to go ahead and give you some background about, uh, about the film you'll see tonight. 
and, uh, and Ethan Steinman, who's the filmmaker who, who produced the film. Um, so Ethan Steinman's a Seattle-based documentary maker who lived in Argentina from 2004 to 2011. Living along the Andes and seeing the ice caps daily, he realized how little he knew about the importance of glaciers in the world. While exploring the idea of shooting a film about glaciers, he happened upon Dr. Thompson on a glacier in Peru. Very, very appropriate. <laughs> the more he learned, the more he realized how little society is aware of the workings of the natural world and felt that through stories of human impact, an emotional connection can be made that ultimately leads to a social change. The film in this segment is taken from Glacial Balance, which is the title of the full piece. So you'll see about a fifth of the work tonight. But I think it's spectacular both in the way that he's combined it, the way he's done the filming in a different way that we haven't seen before, and, I, and the narrative that he's able to weave to kind of the traditional culture and the impact on people, which is kind of what, uh, what we're most interested in. So without further ado, 